We're going to begin today's video in the 1300s by looking at a different John to today's video, John Wycliffe. Now, the medieval Catholic Church had a stranglehold on Europe and Wycliffe was one of the rare voices raised against them as he began a movement called Lollardy. The Lollards had two main principles. Number one, the authority of the Bible was considered a higher authority than that of the Pope. And number two, they believed that everyone deserved to read the Bible in a language that they could understand. Wycliffe translated the Bible into English and then when he died, his followers continued to make copies. Remember, this is before the Gutenberg printer and so every copy had to be handwritten. And so the story went like this. A Lollard would produce a copy of the Wycliffe Bible and pass it on before being tortured and sometimes executed by Archbishop William Courtney. As an illegal movement, Lollardy would eventually make its way to the focus of today's video, Jan Hus, whose dying words were believed to be, you are going to burn a goose, but in 100 years you will have a swan, which you can neither roast nor boil. 102 years later, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses. Hello there. Okay, let's get straight into it. For today's question, let me know below which figure of church history do you most want to see covered in this Insiders in Exiles series. Now, when it comes to Yan Hus, let's backtrack for a second and explain exactly how the writings of a dead English dude made his way to a Czech guy. You see, in 1382, Richard II of England married Anne of Bohemia. Basically, Bohemia was part of the Holy Roman Empire and it's where the modern day Czech Republic is. So with this royal marriage, lots of Bohemian students made their way over to Oxford to study. One of these students was Jerome of Prague, who agreed with John Wycliffe's ideas and converted to Lollardy. He then brought those ideas back to Bohemia, and there they found their way to a Catholic priest, Jan Hus. Now, funnily enough, the only reason that Jan Hus joined the priesthood was that he didn't want to quote, work a real job, and this wasn't out of the ordinary at all. This was an era where the Roman Catholic Church was perhaps at its most corrupt, and this isn't Protestant bias, this is freely admitted by Catholic historians. Firstly, there were two people claiming to be the Pope. Pope Urban VI in Rome, and then Pope Clement VII in Avignon, France. Now, the Cardinals basically didn't like that Urban VI ignored them, and so they then appointed a second Pope, Clement VII. Oh, come on, not this thing, really? Brian, it's me, Stewie! Shoot him! No, Brian, you know me! Look at me! Shoot him! Secondly, just like in the era of Luther, salesmen made heaps of money selling indulgences to unsuspecting peasants who paid a fortune to see their grandparents, for example, get less time in purgatory. And then finally, Hus himself was allowed to teach an entire congregation the word of God just because he didn't want to work in the fields. I should also add at this point that Hus was the Czech word for goose. So when anglicized, Jan Hus becomes John Goose. He made lots of jokes about his name too. And so Jan Hus became captivated with the principles of Lollardy. He was so disillusioned with the Catholic authorities and so the idea of the Bible having authority over the Pope actually made perfect sense. Unlike what most of medieval Europe believed, if the Bible clearly taught something contrary to the Pope, well then the Pope could be wrong. For Hus, the Pope didn't hold the ability to perfectly interpret the Bible and earlier church teachings. And things got pretty interesting when in 1508, Europe decided to add in a third Pope, Alexander V, as a way of settling the dispute. Another one. According to John Fox, who's had this to say about the hat trick of Popes? How can you have three Popes? Not the Pope, but Christ only as the head. And so in 1414, the Council of Constance was called, and this was seen as a way of getting things back on track. Firstly, the council was called to try and bring Europe back down to one Pope, but then secondly, it was called as a way of dealing with the Hussite problem. You see, many Europeans converted to become Hussites. As the name suggests, they were followers of the teachings of Jan Hus. Now, this was bad news for the Catholic Church because Hus's followers had such little regard for the Pope, and there were a few probably concerned that Hus was leading people to hell. The council asked Hus to come and make an appearance, but Hus obviously knew that this was a suicide mission to be burned at the stake, and he said, No. And then the Holy Roman Emperor, Sigismund, stepped in here and promised that Hus would have safe passage to the trial, and so Hus decided that with the Emperor's guarantee, it was safe to go. And I'm sure you can guess exactly what came next. Sigismund completely double-crossed the goose and he was taken and imprisoned. Sigismund's justification was that he gave him safe passage there as promised, but just not home. He also said that he wasn't bound to a promise made to a heretic. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. A certain point of view? Hus was thrown into a dungeon and was left to rot. And just imagine a medieval dungeon for a second. Cold, filthy, and filled with bubonic rats. However, he was offered an easy way out. At any point throughout the trial, Hus could simply recant and take back his beliefs, and then he'd be free to return. However, he had no intention of doing that. 
The Who's case is interesting because in the medieval world, it was typical to scare a dissident voice into submission. And with adrenaline pumping, a teacher might be just courageous enough to give up their life for what they believed in. For Hoos though, he was more useful alive and having recanted than as a dead martyr. So instead of trying to scare him, the Catholic authorities tried to break him. He was kept in the dungeon for nine months, he became very thin and frail and got incredibly sick. But his resolve wasn't broken. In 1415, they went ahead with his trial, which was as much a fair trial as Stalin's were. And throughout the trial, Hoos said, if you can convince me from scripture why I'm wrong, I'm all is. Otherwise, I stand by what I've taught. He was found guilty and burned at the stake, and according to some sources, his final words were, you are going to burn a goose, but in 100 years you will have a swan which you can neither roast nor boil. 102 years later, Luther would nail his 95 theses to his church drawer in Wittenberg, beginning the Protestant Reformation. I mean, what an accurate prophecy. Almost too accurate. Certainly too accurate not to ask any questions. You see, only in the Lutheran sources do we have Yen Hu saying this quote, however we do know that he loved to make puns about his last name, so I think the most likely explanation is that he did make some pun about a goose being killed, however the specificity of the swan coming 100 years later is so precise that it was probably a bit of Chinese whispers when the Lutherans wrote about it in the 1500s. Nonetheless, Hu's impact lasted well beyond the grave. After his death, the Bohemians were so outraged at Sigmund's backstab that specialist Hussite armies started to form and fight against the Catholic authorities. They were such a nuisance for the Holy Roman Empire that they actually allowed the Hussite church to practice their faith relatively undisturbed, and this would last until 1620, 100 years after the Reformation began, when they were wiped out by Emperor Ferdinand II. As Darwin McCulloch notes, it's the only Western church to have been completely wiped out. Thanks for watching. If you did like this video, don't forget to leave a like for the algorithm and check out our similar video we made on the pastor who defied Hitler, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.